So um, just to say, um, I have no real disclosures. Uh, Tina and I had the privilege of serving together um, on some advisory panels for Gilead related to COVID pharmaceuticals, but I don't think that pertains to this and I have some funding from the NIH. Okay, so in our time together, I wanna to go through kind of three main things with you. Um, the first is I wanna lay the groundwork to make sure that we have at least a common understanding of what I think of as how to evaluate um, for ethical resource allocation. Um, I wanna go through uh, sort of some of the data on what resources we have that I think we know are important to making sure our patients achieve the optimal outcomes. Um, and then finally circle back to how this creates some challenges for us um, in the realm of ethical resource allocation, particularly in the setting of pandemic, but also in other settings as well. So to start, um, I wanna lay the, the foundation and the, plant the idea with you guys that resource allocation is not a new thing just because we entered a pandemic. I think it is, as many of us know, sort of part and parcel of medical care, but particularly critical care on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think this takes forms that are quite concrete. We can think about organ allocation. We know that there are certain scores. We know that there are committee meetings that get together to decide which patients are potentially appropriate to receive transplanted organs. And I think this is sort of the most concrete form where we know that there are some patients, unfortunately, be it due to their uh, socioeconomic uh, situation or their clinical situation, don't quote unquote qualify for organs, which they might otherwise benefit from. But I think it takes even more, um, it is a more common process than this and one that interacts less frequently. And I don't think I'm telling this, uh, I don't think I'm surprising anyone at Montefiore to say that frequently or we are in a situation in some of our hospital settings where we don't have a resource that we need, in particular an ICU bed. And so frequently we're thinking about how to triage patients to or away from a resource they might need. And I think this happens um, with some regularity at most of our academic centers uh, across the US and in some of our community centers. Um, but I think on an even more uh, sort of broad scale, we do some other sorts of resource allocation. So I think that we can all think about both our colleagues and our trainees, but also our interdisciplinary staff. And we can think about the fact that we know that there are some of them that we would prefer to take care of our family members than others, right? There are some with different skill sets and some with different strengths. And we are frequently triaging who is taking care of which patients. I think our nursing staff is actually quite good at that, right? They often, in many circumstances, the lead nurses will think about who is the cadre of nursing uh, nurses that I have on this shift and how should I best allocate them to align well with patient needs. Um, and then finally, I think even within each of us, we're constantly triaging, right? There's only one of us. We have a number of things to do for the day. Which patients am I going to see first? How much time am I going to spend with each of them? Do I do their procedures before I round on them? Do I call their family afterward, et cetera? So I think there's all sorts of triage that happens all the time. Um, and in my opinion, ethical resource allocation means accepting the need for triage, especially during increased demand, and as a result, hopefully rationing rationally. And I think conversely, if we pretend that we don't ever need to triage, nothing will make that need go away. And in fact, what it will allow us to do, unfortunately, is to lead to sort of irrational or potentially unethical rationing. Okay, so with that in mind, how do we think about rationing? So I think to me, there are sort of three keys that I put at the top. The first is to identify the resources in need of rationing, potentially in need of rationing. And we'll go through some of those in a moment. Um, I think the second, which there's been a lot of debate about, certainly in the setting of COVID, is defining what our goals of allocation might be. Um, and this, I just give some examples there, maybe maximizing, maximizing life years or something else. Um, and then I think finally, as we do for any quality project or any initiative we start, we need to sort of identify upfront what our barriers to effective implementation may be, to create a policy or a plan that hopefully incorporates sort of ways or strategies to overcome those barriers and then to continuously reevaluate while we're doing it to make sure that we're not actually creating, uh, we're, we're not stumbling upon these barriers. And, and I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. Okay, so to start with identifying resources, I'm gonna steal this strategy from sort of operating there's a sort of broader uh, version of this that is actually four S's, not just three S's, but for my purposes, the three were easier. The fourth, um, in case people are interested, is system. So it's sort of how the system works to, to help you understand operational efficiencies. But I want to go through in each of these, the types of resources that we are frequently interacting with, the space, the most concrete version of that is an ICU bed, although I think as you guys probably saw more than any of us, um, sometimes that's more than that, right? It's what other spaces can I turn into an ICU? What, what uh, capabilities do they have, et cetera? Um, it's staff, and I think this is, at least in my perspective, um, the most important. Um, you know, We can make a, a hotel bed function like an ICU bed if we get the right people there, and we 
we can't do much with an ICU bed without a good ICU nurse. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, and then stuff, and we'll talk about those as well. Okay, so just to take one at a time. Again, I don't, I don't think this is news to any of you. You guys felt this before the rest of us did. But obviously, space, especially in the setting of COVID, became incredibly important, right? There were numerous news articles talking about how we just don't have enough ICU beds. And I think actually, in my mind, frequently focused upon the physical structure, much more so than the staff and the resources otherwise. But let's just speak about what we know about this. So I think, you know, looking to before COVID, we have some evidence um, that the access to an ICU bed at the time that it's needed um, is potentially um, of great importance to the outcome of the patients that are in need of that bed. And the studies aren't wonderful. They're not randomized control trials. We don't tend to, tend to randomize people to not get the bed that was available for them. But just to give you a little bit of the information that we have, I thought this was a nice study. Um, it was looking at uh, 40 some odd, I think 48 ICUs in the UK. They had about 12,000 patients who were asked for evaluation by critical care, similar to your critical care consult team, to see if they needed critical care care uh, transfer. And as you can see here, about 4,500 of them were deemed to be appropriate for critical care. And as you can see then following down this flow diagram, only about 50 of them, 50% of them were able to go directly to the ICU on the left-hand side. And that was because of availability of beds. And the other 50% had either delayed transfer to critical care when a bed became available, or ultimately didn't go to the ICU at all, either because they improved by the time a bed became available, or unfortunately because they died while waiting for a bed. And so these authors used this opportunity to evaluate kind of what impact having an ICU bed available would have on their patient outcomes. So they divided um, sort of their system into three states. And those are in this dark blue at the bottom. The first is where they had no critical care beds available. The second was where they had one and the third was where they had two or more. And as you can see, the vast majority of the time across all their evaluations, they had two or more. Um, but interesting what you can see um, is that not surprisingly, their recommendations that the person needed an ICU were quite similar, right? Independent of how many beds the person needed. But there was a decreased likelihood of being admitted and particularly of being admitted promptly, which they defined as less than four hours from the time of consultation, if there were no beds or fewer uh, beds available. And similarly, there was a higher risk of death and a higher risk of a higher time to transfer in the ICU in the absence of available beds. Sort of suggesting again, that if you can't make it to the ICU and somebody thinks you need it, you may be, uh, you may be suffering from that effect. And in fact, what they found looking at these sort of prompt admissions versus the ones who never got to go at all, um, they found that, uh, never got to go at all or, or went later, I'm sorry. They found that there was about a halving of their odds of survival um, if they had to wait. And so this sort of suggests, again, it's not a randomized trial that early transfer for people who are necessary, is it, for people for whom it is judged necessary to go to the ICU may be beneficial. Um, there are many other studies like this. And so I pulled this meta-analysis just to tell you that other people have studied this. Um, as you might imagine, one of the areas that's challenging here is that there's no consistency in what is defined as early, right? So this is a compilation of 20 some odd, uh, 20 some odd studies of transfer to the ICU that were defined as early versus not early. And they can range anywhere from a few hours to upwards of 24 hours. But I think what you can see, and just to, to orient people who are not as familiar with forest plots. So for these, and we'll see a few of these, um, we have all the different studies included in the meta-analysis here as individual rows. They tell us some basic information about the studies themselves. And then here on the right-hand side, we have surrounding, in this case, a risk ratio, risk ratio associated with death by either hospital discharge or ICU discharge, et cetera, whatever was used in that individual study. Um, here, the risk ratio of one would mean it makes no difference if you get a delayed admission or an early admission. And in this instance, um, the way they, and they didn't label it very well for us here, but a, a lower than one risk ratio was uh, in the direction of favoring uh, early uh, transfer to the ICU. So that you were associated with less risk of mortality if you were transferred early. And you can see that most of the studies, although the confidence intervals are wide, do fall in the direction favoring early admission, which again, I don't think is rocket science. This is, we think we add something by bringing someone to the ICU. We probably should do it sooner rather than later. Okay. Um, so how about stuff? So I think stuff to me, I picked out sort of five things that I think matter, um, three of which uh, uh, I think are most important to patients. So in this, in this circumstance, uh, ventilators, dialysis, which I know you guys dealt with both of how to handle those, um, and then also medication shortages, which some of you may know is sort of an interest of mine. Um, I think there's another one that I'm going to call out here, but I've actively avoided in this setting, which is PPE. I think obviously there are major challenges with resource allocation of PPE, but I don't think, although there probably are some downstream or indirect effects on the patients, they're not directly resources for the patients. So I just want to go through each on its own. What do we know about delaying access to these resources? 
So um, the answer is, again, these studies aren't great, right? We don't, we don't randomize people to having their mechanical ventilation delayed if we think they need it. But what information do we have? So this is a study that came out of Korea. It was a single center study. Um, this is not in the era of coronavirus, so this predated coronavirus. And they looked at patients who had required high flow nasal cannula. And they said, if you required high flow, high flow nasal cannula and you ultimately needed intubation, was there an association of worse outcomes if you got intubated within 48 hours of your start of high flow nasal cannula versus after 48 hours? With the less than 48 hours being not delayed and the after being delayed. And what they found was covariates, that there was a significantly reduced risk of needing to, of, uh, of mortality, I'm sorry, associated with having a earlier intubation in the people who ultimately needed to be intubated. And that's the risk ratio of 0.3, I'm sorry, odds ratio of 0.32 or a reduction in the odds of death of about 70%. Similarly, they found a nearly threefold likelihood or odds of being extubated ultimately if you were one of the people in that early group. Again, suggesting that if we could somehow pick out the people who really needed mechanical ventilation, we probably should do it earlier rather than later. Um, as far as COVID, I think as you guys know, this has been sort of I can't say it's question number one, because I feel like we probably have 100 questions that are question number one, right? But this is this is amongst the questions that we've all struggled with, which is when do we intubate these people? Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people have attempted to look at this. The challenge with all of these studies is they are all retrospective. They are all uh, observational. And so they all have almost assuredly what we would call indication bias, right? The providers are deciding why they are intubating or not at that moment. And that's very hard to adjust for. Um, but again, this is one of these forest plots. It's looking at about 12 studies of patients with COVID to see if they were there were associative outcome, associative increased mortality when patients were intubated early versus late. And here early was less than 24 hours. Um, and as you can see, these numbers, they're all small studies. They have large confidence intervals, but their, their um, confidence intervals tend to hover around this odds ratio, risk ratio of one line. Um, although not statistically significant, as some of you may know, I think this was discussed quite a bit when it came out, there was actually a, a trend toward or a point estimate um, suggesting that actually early intubation was associated with harm. Their early intubation led to about a 7% by point estimate increased odds of death. Um, I don't think anybody is saying that therefore from this, we know this, but I think there's a little bit of a question here about whether or not early intubation in general is helpful, and if so, in whom. Um, and then I think as, as probably everybody who does any kind of medicine, let alone critical care can attest, we don't have a lot of information about what happens to people who require mechanical ventilation who we don't intubate. Right? Unfortunately, in the realm of COVID, we have some, right? We, we do have these people who we know we would have intubated, but for the lack of resources. But I think most of us can argue that this is probably not universally true. But I think one would argue that, that for most patients for whom we think there is a high need for mechanical ventilation, withholding that is probably associated with poor outcomes, although we will never study them. Okay, so what about dialysis? So this is not specific to the ICU, but this was a meta-analysis recently published looking at patient hospitalized patients with acute kidney injury, inclusive of, although not restricted to ICU patients. And they looked at 14 RCTs that had looked at what was quote unquote, the early initiation versus the later initiation of, uh, of uh, renal replacement therapy. And again, their, their definition of early and late was inconsistent, but let's just assume that in general, these are getting it done sooner versus waiting for people for whom it was not considered emergent. Um, and as you can see here, and they've nicely, I stole this uh, uh, visual abstract from them, but they've nicely highlighted, I think, the importance, which is there was absolutely no difference in, in sort of good patient outcomes, particularly impact on mortality, length of stay, things like this. But instead, what they found, right, was more people ended up on dialysis if you started early. And if anything, there were complications associated with dialysis. So there was hypophosphatemia and hypotension. Again, this is not specific to the ICU, but just gives us an idea that we're not really sure, right, what to do with some of these modalities and when to use them. And it's not clear, actually, to me anyway, you know, maybe being forced to hold off on some of them may not be so bad. And again, I'll just say here that I think that we don't really have the study to tell us whether or not the person with a potassium of 12, um, when they don't get dialyzed, I think we can all probably agree that they're not going to do well. Okay, so what do we know about medication shortages? So these are interesting. Um, there have been several studies because I think they're interesting because I, I find this area fascinating. But, you know, we've, these are some um, experiences that for better or worse, we've all uh, lived through in that there have been national shortages of some of our uh, critical care medications. And so certain people and certain groups have taken the opportunity to sort of study that in this setting. So what do we know about sedation? So the first thing I would say, and I think you guys, um, you know, know this from your ICU world anyway, but the PADIS guidelines recommended to us, right, that in the, that in the realm of uh, sedation medications, not 
uh, analgesia focused medications, but pure sedation, that we should favor steering away from benzodiazepines. And the idea for that, right, was that propofol was supposedly, and I think uh, with good data suggesting quicker to uh, the target uh, sedation levels, but then also um, uh, dexmedetomidine and probably uh, propofol as well had fewer bad side effects. And in particular, dexmedetomidine had some studies suggesting shorter durations of mechanical ventilation like this day in delirium. So I think some sort of evidence that, that maybe this is a good idea and many sort of head to head studies, but how does that impact us in the setting of shortage? Do we know how to change away from those um, and, and come up with similar outcomes? And I thought this was interesting. There are three studies that I was able to find that were published um, looking at the impact of a national shortage in 2009 to 2010 of propofol. They're all single center studies. They're all before after, right? They all look at, we used to use propofol. Now we don't have access to propofol. How do things look? Um, in the first, which is the one that took place in Boston, this is um, amongst non-cardiac surgery, uh, non surgery ICU patients. Um, and, the, and their uh, replacement for propofol included uh, dexmedetomidine, but also benzodiazepine. So that's a bit of a mixed study. The other two also single center studies, but only in cardiac surgery patients. And here, when they had to replace propofol, they only used dexmedetomidine. So I think there, there are a number of things that are different between the first one and the second two. Um, but what you can see is that in general, there was no harm or no statistically significant harm associated with the use or the replacement of propofol. So suggesting that if that's our go-to, maybe our, maybe our uh, impact of shortage may not be so bad. Um, certainly within the Boston study, there was a concern that there may be a uh, trend toward in worse outcomes. But again, remember that this was replacement with a lot of benzodiazepine, not just X. Um, and actually, interestingly, in the cardiac surgery population uh, in the Philadelphia hospital, they actually found improved outcomes, which again, I think is consistent with some of the newer randomized control trials on X. But again, I think, you know, we have this idea that this is the medication we should use. And certainly in our setting, and we did experience uh, propofol shortages, um, we found ourselves often flipping to things that we're less familiar with. So in our case, that was ketamine. Um, and I, I will say that I'm not so sure, me personally, that I did such a good job uh, sedating my patients or keeping them comfortable with ketamine, maybe because I'm just not so familiar with it. But this is the data that exists. Um, and then this was a study that uh, Emily Vale, who's currently at Penn, uh, led for us, uh, looking at other medications that we may, may use in the ICU, and in particular, vasopressors. So um, again, we took the opportunity to, to study a natural experiment. In uh, the latter half of 2011, there was a national shortage of norepinephrine. And as many of you uh, know, norepinephrine has been recommended as first-line vasopressor for septic shock for quite some time. And so we divided, uh, we used uh, hospitals that are across the U.S. from something called the Premier Perspectives Database, and we identified 26 hospitals where we could we could clearly say that before the uh, shortage was uh, was in place, they were sort of high norepinephrine using hospitals. Amongst their patients with septic shock, they had at least 60% of their patients got norepinephrine, and that's this baseline here. Um, and then these were also hospitals where during the shortage, they experienced at least a 20% reduction in their see is this little downtrend here, and then they rebounded back after the shortage. So this, we, we specifically picked these hospitals as those who seem to really experience the shortage in a way that we thought may impact their patients. And as you can see, interestingly, first of all, um, what actually seemed to replace norepinephrine was dopamine, uh, I'm sorry, was phenylephrine, um, and with, with dopamine as a close second. It's sort of interesting, right? Those are by no means um, the second or even third line vasopressors recommended for septic shock. Um, so it's sort of interesting that that's what we all did, but it does seem that that's the case. Um, and we use this uh, sort of natural experiment to ask the question, if you were a patient admitted with septic shock to a hospital that experienced shortage during shortage, did your outcome suffer? And in fact, we found that they did. So uh, that, this is our main analysis here. This is after adjusting for things related to patient, uh, patient comorbidities, uh, severity of illness, et cetera, that if you were admitted to a hospital during a shortage quarter versus either before or after the shortage, you had a 15% uh, increased odds of mortality by hospital discharge. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with the difference in differences methodology, this allows us to, to use other hospitals that didn't experience shortage as a control to account for sort of secular trends and outcomes in case mix. And as you can see, the numbers are fairly identical. Um, and something else that I'm not putting up here, but I, I like to say, because I think it is a testament to the value of peer review. Um, we added an analysis to this that was suggested to us by one of the reviewers, which I think really brought home this point, which is they asked us to look at patients with sepsis who did not require vasopressors. So obviously for whom this shortage should not have impacted outcomes. And we saw no difference over time. So that was kind of a nice, uh, nice complimentary analysis. But again, I think suggesting that some shortages can be problematic. 
Okay. And then what about staff? So I think, you know, all of us who have been staff in an ICU in the last year and a half um, are not surprised to know that sometimes we've been assured. Um, as you know, there's been a lot of news related to this, but I thought what was most interesting is quite early on, both the CDC and the Society of Critical Care Medicine came out sort of with suggestions of how we should manage this. Now, I'm not saying that they were always so easy to do, or even we would all agree with them, but I think they recognized early on that this would be a problem. Okay, so what do we know about the impact of staff? I mean, some of you know this is sort of um, an area that I'm particularly interested in. Um, so I'm just going to give you sort of a whirlwind overview of what we know about staff, um, some of which supports, I think, um, our bias that were very important and some of which doesn't. Um, so this is a meta-analysis that Liz Wilcox uh, in Toronto and her colleagues did now about eight years ago. So there are some newer studies that I'll tell you in a second that are not included. Um, but they looked at the impact of published, across published studies, the impact of having what's called high intensity intensive staffing. So for those of you who are not familiar, and I know that the fellow applicants, you're all at different places, so I don't know how your ICUs are set up. What, we, what you guys have at Montefiore, what we have where I am is what we call closed model staffing, meaning all patients are transferred to the care of an intensivist, um, I should say. In the medical ICU at Montefiore, they're all transferred to the care of an intensivist. That's closed model staffing. What you guys have in the surgical units is this mandatory intensivist consultation, right? The primary team is uh, maintained as the surgeon, but you guys are uh, must be involved with and are heavily involved with all of the patients. Both of those would fit into high intensity staffing. Lower intensity staffing would be there's no critical care uh, practitioner available or they're available as needed, but are not uh, part of uh, all patients' care. And so as you can see here, and again, this is one of those forest plots on the left-hand side, as they've labeled down here, this is um, with the uh, largest uh, mortality in each study, the, the longest duration mortality in each study, which for many studies was hospital level mortality. You can see that there's um, a distinct advantage in most studies, there's one, one nice outlier, but in most studies um, favoring the presence of high intensity intensive staffing. I'll call your attention here. This is a study um, by Mitch Levy and colleagues using Project Impact that made a huge splash when it came out, right? Because it basically said that involving intensivists was associated with harm. Um, there's, there was a lot of sort of thought about why that might be, a lot of potential confounding, et cetera. But just know that there are some studies, and this one is quite large, that suggest that. But I think overall, and I hope that we believe this, that we add some value. Um, but I will say, as I mentioned, this was this was a fairly old at this point meta analysis. And so there are two studies I think that I, I want you guys to be aware of as, as U.S. practicing people um, that have come out since then uh, in the U.S. Because I think it says something about kind of the type of environment we work in. So on the left hand side is results from a study by Dana Kelly Costa in which they were particular. She was particularly she's a nurse researcher for those of you who don't know her, and she was particularly interested in the impact of interdisciplinary team care. But they one of the many things that they evaluated was what the presence of an intensivist in a high uh, intensity staffing model had on patient outcomes. This was using uh, a data set called Apache Outcomes, and so it was about 50 ICUs across about 25 hospitals in the U.S. Um, and as, as I put here, this was uh, a data from about 10 years ago. Um, and as you can see, they found no association between the existence of a high intensity daytime intensive staffing model and mortality at the end of hospital discharge. And then similarly in this study here by Nagendran and colleagues, they use data from what are called leapfrog hospitals. Um, there are about 500 of them, I think, in their data set. And these are hospitals that comply or that, that partner with the leapfrog group to provide benchmarking and provide quality information and receive benchmarking, I'm sorry. Um, and um, they looked at how they divided hospitals by those that earlier on in their stay, which was 2003 to 2004 versus later on from a low intensity staffing model to a higher intensity staffing model. And when they looked at how those hospitals that changed, so incorporated more intensivists versus didn't change, they found no difference associated with the transition. So again, suggesting that in these circumstances, they found a difference. So why might that be? So this is the attention I just wanted to call for you guys. So for those of you like myself, who've only practiced in the US, I think we think that all of critical care looks like what we see. Um, and this is a study now, now about 13 years uh, old from Hannah Lynch and her colleagues, where they just looked at what is the availability of both hospital resources and critical care resources across westernized countries. Um, and as you can see, and there's some other graphs that I've chosen not to include, but here on the x-axis, they have the number of hospital beds per 100,000 population. And on the uh, y-axis ICU beds. And as you can see, they generally fall along the line with one notable exception, us, right? We have many, many more ICU beds per hospital bed per population. And so the way I would interpret that is, right, we just tend to have more of our hospital beds function as ICU beds. They are ICU capable, they theoretically have an ICU nurse, et cetera, et cetera. And what that may mean um, 
and there's some data to support this, what that may mean is that the acuity of the patients in our ICUs are lower than they are in other places, right? Because we just have more availability of ICU beds relative to hospital beds. Now, again, if you're practicing at Montefiore, you're feeling like not the case, right? So I just want to remind us, all of us who work in academic centers, this is not the experience that we often feel. But remember, academic centers are a very small fraction of the ICUs in the U.S., right? So overall, this is the experience. I'm not pretending that this is how you guys live. Um, so how does this play into critical? So I should say, what this means to me, right, is that overall, I think the data suggests that intensivists probably matter. But maybe in a setting where a lot of our patients are just not that ill, it doesn't make that much of a difference. So how does that play into COVID, for instance, or in a high resource time? So I just want to tell, this is the, the little bit of information that, that I was able to find on this uh, question. So I think our COVID patients, not surprisingly, are different. So this is data from the virus registry uh, sponsored by SCCM. Um, and in this, they, at the time that they published the study, they had about 20,000 people, this is primarily from the US, but also from around the world, about 8,700 of whom were in the ICU. And of those patients in the ICU, and you know, they didn't do this calculation, so I'm sure my numbers aren't perfect. There are probably some patients with missing data, but about 60, about, I'm sorry, 57% of them were mechanically ventilated. So if we think about the typical COVID patient in ICU, be it because they are more sick than our, than our typical ICU population, or be it because we just don't have enough beds and so we're rationing away people who would otherwise have come, we have about 57% of them are mechanically ventilated. Um, this is in sort of great contrast to the typical US ICU population. And again, if you're sitting at Montefiore, this doesn't make sense to you, but just remember that, that that's not the typical here. So again, this data is pretty old, but I don't think it's changed a lot. Um, so this is using data from about 15 years ago now, um, project impacts. So using a, a cohort of hospitals around the US. And as you can see in this sort of green highlighted here, only about 40% of patients at any given time in the ICU at any given hour of the day are mechanically ventilated in the US. This is much lower than in the UK and probably much higher than in some other places. I should say much and higher than some other places. Um, and I think not surprisingly, they tend to veer toward um, surgical populations, right? These are people coming out of the operating room and also just to make you guys feel better, um, academic populations, right? This is, this is where we see a lot of our moil. But in general, um, the COVID patients are probably more typically critically ill and may, in my opinion, at least benefit from intensive care. Okay, just to go through quickly our other providers, not that they don't matter, but just because the data is a little less, uh, less robust. Um, so there are a bunch of studies that looked at the addition of advanced practice providers, nurse practitioners, physician assistants into the care of an ICU team. I had the privilege when I was at Montefiore of, of doing one such study with Michelle and others. So um, this is an area that, that I think is exciting. Um, but this was a nice uh, summary put together by Ruth Kleinhill and her colleague looking at 44 studies that looked at the availability of APPs in any kind of critical setting. So that could be the emergency department, it could be trauma, it could be an ICU, about 20 of them were ICU studies. Um, and in most instances, the APP is similar to what you guys have, right? Or added to a team or quote unquote, replacing a fellow or resident, basically being in a role that in another unit might be filled by a fellow or resident. And in general, and this is what their summary was, that they demonstrated similar outcomes. And I put here, these are all the different outcomes that the different studies looked at. And actually, if anything, they saw reductions in length of stay and reductions in cost associated with the use of APPs. So that's not you know, cost effectiveness, it's just cost overall of the patient's stay. But I think if anything, we have a sense that APPs are absolutely an equal and valuable way to expand critical care resources and may even be better, right? Okay, um, nursing work workload, this is like summarizing, you know, uh, decades of work into one study, into one slide. But um, this is a fairly recent meta-analysis looking at the ratio of patients to nurses. Um, and as you can see, again, on the left-hand side of this odds ratio, this is the odds ratio of death by hospital discharge. Um, the likelihood of death was lower if the nurse had fewer patients. This is uh, exclusive to ICUs. There are many, many studies looking at uh, many other populations. Most of them show this. Some in the ICU show no difference. I've yet to find one that shows harm, but, but there, are certainly, um, there are certainly some contradicting studies. But I think separate from nursing work, workload, there's more to think about. And to me, this became very clear in the setting of COVID. And I think you guys, we didn't, but my guess is you did experience this to some degree, right? A nurse is not a nurse is not a nurse, right? So you guys getting a nurse from the outpatient clinic is not the same thing as having an ICU nurse. And obviously some of that is experiential training, but some of that actually is their education as well. And so this is the, the to my knowledge, there are no studies published on what happened when I replaced all my ICU nurses with outpatient 
clinic nurses, but there are some studies like this one from Dina's group again, that looked at what things about nursing actually impacted patient outcomes. This was particular to ICU patients. She did a survey in Pennsylvania, inclusive of about 300 hospitals and 5,500 patients. Um, and as you can see here, she looked at many different things about nurse staffing. Um, interestingly, she found that in this particular study, no association between the number of patients that a nurse had and their outcomes in the ICU. Again, not uncommon. There are plenty of studies that show this, but particularly, and I've heard Dina talk about this a lot, she's very interested in the idea of nurse education that, you know, for those of us, and certainly myself, who doesn't, doesn't think about it. I always forget if my nurse is a registered nurse, certainly if they have a master's level or, or a bachelor's level, I, you know, it's all sort of uh, mixed to me, but at least in her mind, that is incredibly different. And I would just point out, this is not ICU nurses in particular, but if you look across the, across the country, um, there is distinct variability in the educational background of most of our nurses. This is all registered nurses. So this is people could be working in the community, they could be working in ICU. And I will also caution you that I did not make this color coding. The color coding is totally off. So there are some that don't fall in these buckets. I don't know what to do with that, but just in general, the darker blue are the ones where a higher percentage are. And as you can see, it's sort of in the Midwest and out West. You guys are certainly better off than, than we are down here in the Southeast. And in fact, when I gave this talk um, or something similar to it in Georgia, um, we all sort of bemoaned the fact that, that this is not something that's been important in the Southeast. But I think Dina would argue that this is actually as important, if not more important in terms of uh, patient outcomes as the number of patients that a nurse has. Okay, and then what about our other providers? So uh, there's not a ton of data that I think is particularly compelling about this. There is lots and lots of data showing that adverse events, medication events are impacted by clinical pharmacists. I think any of us who worked with a clinical pharmacist understand the, the value that they bring. But in terms of good studies that show patient-centered outcomes, I don't think there are tons. So I like this one because it sort of gets at that. Um, and it's kind of a silly study and tells you how good we are as providers. So this was a before after study of an intervention at two MICUs at Boston, I think Boston Medical Center. And basically all they did was have a pharmacist show up on rounds and remind the providers of the pro protocol they already had in place. So it was a sedation protocol that already existed and nothing changed. All they did was say, hey guys, remember you have this protocol and you're kind of off from uh, it. No, I'm gonna go there. Um, and in doing that, uh, I should say, as you can see before and after, the, the patient populations are not identical. Um, the patients in the intervention group tended to have different kind of diagnoses. They were a little less uh, ill. Um, unfortunately, these are not adjusted outcomes. Um, so there are some challenges with that, but you can see that even just having the pharmacist there to remind yeah. people of what they are doing um, led to reductions in mechanical ventilation duration, ICU mm -hmm. length of day. They look quite meaningful. Remember to always so uh, the, other, the other clinicians I think we all think are valuable. There's not a lot of data out for. So just to give you some idea of what we have, uh, looking at the impact of early mobilization, you guys know this well, I know you've really led some of this work. But meta-analyses suggest that, the, that having an early mobilization program is associated with improvements for mechanically ventilated patients in the duration of mechanical ventilation and ICU length of state. There are obviously some that don't show that, but in general, that's the, that's the uh, trend of all of them. And this was a meta-analysis to combine them. It doesn't speak specifically to physical therapy, although I thought interesting, Rita Bakker and her colleagues, when they did an international survey, found, I think not surprisingly, that having a dedicated physical therapist in the ICU was associated with nearly two and a half times the odds of having an early mobilization program. So one can sort of put together that maybe having one will lead to early mobilization, et cetera. Um, and then much to my chagrin, when I gave this talk last time, one of the respiratory therapists came up to me and said, I'm glad you mentioned this, we don't have any data. I could find nothing on respiratory therapists at all. And I think this is sort of sad. Um, but as I think many of you know, um, the recommendations for how we think about mechanical ventilation involve protocols, particularly ventilator liberation protocols. And I think there are many studies that suggest that using a protocol that is directed by nursing plus minus respiratory therapy um, is superior to asking a provider to make decisions on his or her own. So I think there is again, some suggestion that these people matter. And again, you know, therefore diluting them out to be problematic. Okay, so I hope, and I, again, most of you I think probably had this thought to begin with, but I hope I have somewhat convinced you that a functional ICU requires enough space enough stuff, and hopefully most of the time, uh, enough appropriate staff. So what have we learned from COVID in terms of straining these resources? So there are four studies um, that I just wanted to highlight um, that I thought were interesting because I think many of us have felt um, the impact of strain, but what do we know from a data perspective suggesting that patients are impacted negatively? So this was the first that came out and it was across 88 VAs. It did not look particularly at patients in the ICU. This is patients in the hospital and in the ICU with COVID. And they basically asked after adjusting for several other confounders, demographics, comorbidities, et cetera, what was the impact on these patients of being admitted at times of hospital strain with COVID? And they, they uh, conceptualized this in two different ways. 
The first was COVID ICU load, which is I put here, is the number of ICU patients during your ICU stay as an ICU patient um, divided by the number of beds in your ICU, right? So that the idea like, are you sort of stretched more than your typical capacity? And the second being COVID ICU demand, which is number of ICU patients during your ICU stay, sorry, this should say during your hospital stay, you may not be an ICU patient, but how many, basically how stressed was the ICU at the time that you're there? divided by the peak number of ICU patients that that hospital ever cared for. And they uh, categorize this. Um, and what you can see is that amongst patients admitted to the ICU, there's a dose response relationship, right? That the more strained your ICU was during COVID, either based on the number of beds you normally have or based on the peak occupancy, you were uh, more likely to die or have a higher odds of death, hazard of death. But interestingly, and I, I don't think this suggests that, that ICU strain is necessarily affecting ward patients, but really the ICU strain is a marker of hospital strain overall. That actually, as there was more and more ICU strain, there was actually higher likelihood of death for patients who never went to the ICU. Now, some of that may be that those are patients who should have gone to the ICU and couldn't go, but some of that may be just that the hospital itself is strained. Okay, um, these next two studies are sort of a little bit more vague in their assessment of this. These are both from the Stop COVID Registry. Um, I forget, I think you guys did participate in that. I don't remember, but anyway, this was a, a registry organized out of the Brigham um, where they collected patients in the first three or four months of the pandemic. Um, and so this one was early on. Um, I'm not suggesting the number of ICU beds that you have is, is a good marker of how strange your hospital is, but one might imagine that lower number, smaller ICU hospitals are less able to absorb the kind of excess capacity. And you can see that again, the higher number of ICU beds, there are many other potential reasons for this it was associated with lower odds of death than being in a hospital with lower beds. But I think more sort of robustly, Matt Chirpek, when he looked at this data, again, a couple of months later, so we had more uh, patients involved, but he actually asked the question, what are the types of drivers? And, and those of you who know Matt, Matt, he's a big machine learning uh, AI kind of person. So I leave that to, to Tina and the other one of you guys who understand that. But just let's all go with, he put a bunch of stuff into a model. What are the groups of things that, that really explain the variability in, in hospital mortality? And as you can see, although patient level physiology explains the, the bulk of it, right? 50%, that makes sense. But still about 9% of variability in, in mortality was explained by hospital strain characteristics, which are, which are inclusive of the types of things listed here. Again, suggesting that hospitals who are without, with less space, less staff, and less stuff may be uh, doing less well for their patients. Um, and then finally, this was a study that came out in the Annals um, of Internal Medicine that looked, again, using Premier. We've mentioned that for the norepinephrine shortage uh, analysis, about 550 hospitals across the U.S. These are not ICU patients. These are all patients. These are patients identified by ICD-10 codes, so there are some challenges with that. But they basically said, what is the likelihood of death by hospital discharge if you're a hospitalized patient being admitted to one of these hospitals at times of higher strain? They define strain in a slightly more convoluted way. They included in kind of a clever idea, sort of they weighted um, impact of having an ICU patient versus a floor patient versus a step-down patient. They basically said, we need more nursing resources for that. Um, but as you can see, and you'll just, I can give you the definition, but it's complicated. Um, just uh, the, the linear dose response that you see, right? Where that the more strain you had, so there were uh, greater than 99% of your capacity defined by the strain metric versus less than 50%, you had a much higher odds of death. So again, all of these things sort of suggesting that I think what we intrinsically know and feel as practitioners that when we are strained and stressed, probably because of demands on those three S's, really is unfortunately negatively impacting our patients. Okay, so I hope at this point we've sort of reviewed at least my perspective of why we have to care about resource allocation and how we do that, and what are the things, the levers that matter. So what are the challenges with this context of ethical resource allocation? So I think as many of you probably um, saw around the time, Doug White and many others um, sort of opined about this, right? There's been a lot of debate about how we should allocate things. And I think the four possibilities that he's put up here, he's not advocating for one or another, um, are sort of the types of things people have thought about. So we want a policy that saves the most lives. That's one of those policies that's based on SOFA score, for instance, right? Quick um, assessment of what your short-term mortality is. I don't care if you're gonna live five years, I wanna know if you're gonna live 30 days, right? Um, save the most life years. So that's one that includes, are you going to live for the next 30 days? But it also includes, are you going to live for the next year or two years or five years? So that's one that probably includes SOFA or something like it and comorbidity burden. Then a lot of people advocate that we should prioritize for people with fewer life stages. This is younger age, but I think the, the rationale behind it is not 
that younger people are more valuable, but that older people have had the opportunity to live through more life stages and therefore younger people should get priority. Um, and then finally, I think for a variety of reasons, people have, some people have advocated for prioritizing essential workers because they help our society run, not just you and I, but, but the janitorial staff in our hospital, the, the worker at the local bodega, whatever, right? The people who actually help our society run. And then some people argue that because of the risk we've put ourselves, the, the risky position we've put ourselves in, we may deserve some priority and, and people can debate that. But I think these are sort of the four types of ways that people have thought about this. Um, and as Doug makes a point, and many people have made a point, this is a quote from him, one of his editorials in JAMA, um, we need to be careful though that explicit allocation of, in this case, ventilators, but any resource will not be allocated on the basis of morally irrelevant considerations. And in particular, that it won't bias unintentionally or even intentionally against certain groups, right? So how might that occur? And again, there's a lot of data on this. I'm just gonna give you some examples. I think that unfortunately bias can creep into any of these strategies. So there was an interesting study I thought um, looking at saving the most lives, right? Of why, why would that be something that, that may bias against certain groups? Um, there's a lot of concern, right? That SOFA, uh, one of the SOFA components is dependent upon renal function, that we don't have renal function appropriately um, sort of normalized for all of our different racial and ethnic groups. So there are reasons to be concerned about that. But this study I thought brought another point to it, which may have more to do with disparities in access. Um, this is a study looking at chest radiography on presentation with COVID. And what they found was that non-Hispanic Blacks compared to either uh, non-Hispanic whites or Hispanic patients presented with much, with much more severe chest x-rays. And again, whether that's, you know, duration of symptoms before they show up, whatever it might be, but at the time of presentation, they were not presenting the same. And so short-term mortality um, may again be biased. I think I don't need to convince anyone that we know that there's distinct uh, disparities in comorbidities. This is just one study that pointed that out, diabetes, hypertension, asthma, whatever it might be, particularly you know, sort of negatively impacting our, uh, our uh, underrepresented minority populations. Um, interestingly, there are concerns even when we think about younger age, right? And this actually is one that may favor our underrepresented minorities, so that might be good, right? But if you actually look at the geography, uh, I'm sorry, the demographics of our population, um, the average age or the median age of non-Hispanic whites in the U.S. is substantially older than it is in some of our uh, underrepresented minority patients. So again, you know, looking at age, we need to, if we're going to care about disparities, we need to look at all the potential, you know, upsides and downsides potentially. Um, and then finally, prioritizing uh, essential workers. I think a lot of people have appropriately pointed out that actually it's a lot of our um, otherwise sort of under uh, underrepresented minorities, but people who don't have good access who are actually our essential workers. But I think the other thing that, that this study in particular pointed out is that the risk of the, un, of the essential worker job is very different um, by demographics. And that the job that you know, we would be considered, uh, myself, I should say, as an intensivist would be considered an essential worker, but my risk may be quite different than the nurse or the nursing assistant um, or the janitor, et cetera. And that there probably are socioeconomic differences in those two groups. So this also um, creates potential bias. Um, when we look at what is available, and obviously, as many of you know, many hospitals and institutions have tried to create policies for, for triage management during crisis standards of care, um, but there are also some at the state level. I know New York was very um, sort of at the forefront, largely because you guys had to deal with this um, right off the bat um, as being one of the ones that was held up. Um, this is an interesting study, I think, by Dr. Cleveland Machenda. She's written a bunch about, she's very concerned about disparities related to these policies. And so one of the things that she was highlighting here was how, was the differences in these policies across states, that sort of what you had access to really mattered, like where you happen to be living. Um, again, in, in typical fashion, Florida doesn't have one, because why should we? Um, you guys do have one. Um, and as you can see, they're fairly variable. When I got to do this in Georgia, I got to say it was both of us. Um, at least we're not Texas who like adamantly says we don't have one, right? We just, we just ignore it. Um, but we don't have one. Of the 29 that are available, there were 21 in her review that uh, were very clear on how they would allocate ventilators per se. And of these, she didn't give any comment on, on the age criteria. Many of them use age as like a tiebreaker, but that was not. But you can see all of them looked at something like SOFA or modified SOFA. So what you're likely to save in the most lives early. Um, about two thirds of them included comorbidities. So that's weird, right? If you're an overweight person with diabetes, that matters if you're in, in state one, but not state two. Um, and then about a third of them prioritized essential workers. Again, like really concerning, right? That we have, and this is typical with our, with our end of life uh, information as well, right? That we're just, it matters where you're, where you're living more than anything else. So what is known about whether or not these type of policies can create bias? Um, and this is a question that was of great interest to me and I know to you guys as well, when we were trying to think about, we did not, so as I said, Florida does not have one. Um, we did not have one. We had a crisis standard of care policy that was 
started apparently um, during the Ebola um, you know, scare. And then the moment Ebola went away, it was put in a drawer, right? And never really kind of fleshed out. So we took it out at the time of this. And so we were very interested in this question about how do we create this? So I'm just going to show you what data exists, at least from what I was able to find and, and participate a little bit in on potential biases associated with SOFA score and with these CSC policies in total. So before we do that, a quick primer, because um, this is how all of these are going to be uh, used. So when we think about how well a test works, um, and this could be pap smears for, for cervical cancer, this could be, in this case, you know, SOFA score for mortality. There are sort of two main criteria that people will look at. So one is the discrimination of a test, and that's how well the model or the test discriminates between the people at low risk and high risk. So in particular, if you have a high SOFA score versus a low SOFA score, how good is it at deciding that you're going to die more or less? And this is uh, quantified often by this area under the receiver operating curve. As many of you know, this is a test that has no value. It's literally like flipping a coin. This is a test here that has perfect value. It always picks the people with the higher SOFA score, always the ones who die. And somewhere in between is the reality, right? And so usually our, our area under the receiver operating curves are going to fall somewhere in the sort of 0.6 to 0.8 range, the higher the better. And then there's calibration, which is how good is my test at actually telling me what's going to happen? Not at differentiating two groups, but of saying your SOFA score is this, and therefore you're going to die 10% of the time. And when I actually check, you die 10% of the time. Okay, and so this is often assessed by calibration plots. Again, we're going to see these in a second, so I just want to highlight them for you here. It's a little different than the way they're going to appear. And as you can see here, these this is you know fabricated data. I think. Oh no, it's not actually. It's some actual data set. Um, but that these are the observed values, and this is the model predicted value. And so you can see at higher uh, scores, the model under predicts mortality, and at lower scores, it over predicts mortality. And you could imagine that if this were the case for not higher scores and lower scores, but black patients versus white patients, that might be a problem. Okay, so there are a couple studies that I'm aware of looking at SOFA. The first um, was out of the group at Penn. They looked at data um, prior, oh, sorry, they looked at data prior to COVID. So this is uh, patients who are presenting to the emergency departments at either Penn or Kaiser Permanente hospitals in Northern California. Um, and they were patients with either uh, acute respiratory failure or sepsis. And they looked at what the highest SOFA score they had during their emergency department uh, visit prior to admission. Um, and what they and they divided their particular interest was disparities white versus black. They did not make any uh, ethnicity comments. So this is this is the, the categories they have. And they also looked at some other stuff, but let's focus on SOFA for the moment. So I think what you can see is that overall the uh, sort of discrimination of SOFA is not very good. Right, this sort of less than 0.7, I think that would probably be considered like a fair to poor test. Um, and then it is slightly better, but still not great for black patients than for white patients. However, when you look at calibration, what they found, which was quite concerning to them, it's differently calibrated. Again, this is a very similar concept to the prior graph, but just to orient you, um, this red line is the model absolutely predicts the exact observed, right? So the, the x-axis is the expected of the model prediction, the, the y-axis is what actually was observed. And these are 95% confidence intervals around their estimate. And so what you can see, and it's hard to visualize it in here, but you can see that there's a space where the model predicts uh, the expected mortality is lower than the actual mortality, right? It predicts 0.2, but the actual mortality is above that. So this suggests for white patients that there are some where it is um, overestimating their mortality. Conversely, over here, there are some where the expected mortality is lower than the observed mortality. So it's underestimating black, uh, mortality for black patients. And you might imagine that if a SOFA score is based on your predicted mortality, if you're underestimating it for a minority population, you may be triaging resources away from that, right? And that can be problematic. So this understandably created a bunch of concern. Um, with that in mind, we looked at this um, University of Miami data uh, slightly differently, to be honest. Um, and we asked sort of two different questions. The first was, uh, our challenges with this prior study was that it didn't include COVID patients. And I'm not saying that COVID is necessarily different, but we're talking about triage around COVID. So we wanted to include COVID and non-COVID patients. And we were interested in whether or not SOFA predicted or uh, performed differently in those two groups, let alone across racial and ethnic divides. So the first thing you'll see, and I'll just give you an idea, this is our cohort over here. We have about 20,000 patients in typical sort of Miami uh, demographics, similar to you guys, the vast majority of patients are either Hispanic white or non-Hispanic white, although we do have um, a Haitian Creole population. So that makes up most of the non-Hispanic black. Um, you can see overall that our, uh, our discriminative accuracy was higher um, than what uh, Asana and colleagues found at Penn and, and Kaiser. That may be partly because of the population, but I think also we included SOFA scores up for the first 48 hours of presentation. So I think it allowed people to sort of stabilize a little bit and maybe a little bit better uh, accuracy. 
Um, but we actually notably did not see any differences across race, race or ethnic groups. Um, and then similarly, um, our calibration curves differed from theirs. We found that overall calibration was quite good for the whole pop cohort and all of our racial and ethnic groups um, for patients who were COVID positive, but actually pretty crummy um, in certain instances for patients that were COVID negative. And in particular, um, at the lower uh, values, the predicted probability um, that was lower than the actual probability, than the actual death, suggesting that under um, estimated death and at higher levels of overestimated death. And again, we did not see a dis difference across racial ethnic groups, but also is a little bit concerning, right, in terms of using this score to, to allocate resources. Okay, and then what about crisis standards of care policies? So again, I, there are two studies that I'm aware of. The first um, was by Hannah Wunsch and her colleagues looking at ICU patients in the EICU data set, which is, um, as many of you know, is all the ICUs con uh, contained in the Philips uh, system. Um, and this was data from about seven years ago, so not COVID. And they basically looked at two different ways of categorizing, one of which I think is of great importance to you guys, which was the New York State criteria. And the general idea here is there were some absolute exclusions before. So the people who had certain things absolutely would be uh, triaged away. So for instance, post cardiac arrest, and then SOFA score was used after that. And then the saves lives, life years criteria was, didn't have any absolute exclusions, but had SOFA plus comorbidities as sort of the way they thought about this. So the first and most important thing I would point out, which I think has been borne out by every single one of these studies, is that all of these are pretty terrible at helping us triage patients. As you can see, about 75 to 80% of the people end up in the same group. And that's the group where they would get something. And so in reality, what we're falling back on are all of the secondary tiebreakers that none of us love to begin with. So that's the first thing to point out. Um, but what they found, um, and again, it was not consistent across all groups, but what they found in general was that both of these uh, policies favored uh, non-Hispanic white patients. Um, the one that included comorbidities, Asian patients also did uh, relatively better um, and Hispanic patients. And then um, for the ones that, that included comorbidities, black patients as well, as well did worse. And again, quite, I should say did worse, uh, received lower priority. And that's obviously quite concerning. Um, interestingly, again, I told you guys that we um, created our own policy and were interested in how this would play out. Um, we also, I think, different from you guys, never sort of let our medical students play with COVID early on. We, we sort of had a little bit of leeway in that. And so we had a whole bunch of medical students who were sitting around bored um, and wanted something to do. And so we tasked them with pretending that they were the triage people. And they weren't going to make the final decisions, pretend we're in crisis standards of care and take our policy and calculate triage scores for everybody. Um, on a daily basis. And so we did that at both of our main hospitals. We did it for anybody with COVID and anybody who was in uh, an ICU requiring mechanical ventilation or non-invasive or high flow uh, oxygen support. So basically people we thought might be at risk. Um, and they got us about 1,150 patients, about 5,600 days worth of data. And we asked the question, is our crisis standards of care policy creating unintentional disparities in care? And again, we were, we were concerned that it might do this. And, and obviously our, not, our finding no disparities is not you know, isn't 100% uh, an answer, but it's comforting. The priority score was across all of their days of data, figuring that was the point at which they were most likely to have a ventilator either given to or taken away from them. Um, and as you can see, here's the reference group here is white uh, patients and here is not Hispanic, that there was no difference in the incidence of a higher uh, priority score associated with being of a underrepresented minority ethnicity or race. Again, quite comforting to us, not proof of anything. So take home messages. Um, I think resource allocation is necessary and I think um, it is commonplace despite what we tell ourselves. I think daily we do this in small ways all the time and periodically we're forced to do it in, in, in more substantial ways that we identify as triage. Um, I think pretending resource allocation will never happen only means it will happen irrationally um, and therefore almost assuredly unethically. It may unfortunately be unethical despite, but it, we can make some efforts if, we're, if we own up to a reality. Um, there are many resources I think categorized and staff model um, that can and have been shown to improve or change patient outcomes. You know, a lot of us say a lot of our critical care studies are null. Um, a lot of our therapeutic studies are null. And I think actually as many, if not more of our organizational studies are, are uh, show associations at least with outcomes. Um, surges during COVID uh, suggest that resource limitations impacted patient outcomes. We can't pull out which ones, of course, but I think we all felt that. Um, and that existing policies for resource allocation vary. Um, and the problem with that is that they may be unintentionally unethical in how they allocate resources. And clearly this is a nice thing to end anything with, right? We don't have the final answer. And I think the only thing we can say in something that's unethical is that we have to keep studying it. We owe it to ourselves and to the patients potentially negatively impacted that we iteratively evaluate this and make sure that we do our best to improve any biases.
And that is, I believe, it.